about the multimodality cardiac assessment of, of uh, cardiac masses. And I'll do the first 30 minutes. Dr. Dr. Nabi, who just arrived, <laughs> will do the last 30 minutes. <laughs> So when you look at what echo offers compared to CT and MRI, basically it's big advantage is just giving you dynamic real-time images. Um, of course, you can determine the extent of the mass within the heart, not extra cardiac, but within the heart, and you can determine hemodynamic consequences of the mass. We're specifically talking about obstruction or valvular regurgitation. And you can see if there's predisposing conditions that would have caused the mass in the first place, such as an apical aneurysm for a thrombus or a rheumatic valvular disease for vegetations. Now, there are disadvantages. Of course, there's suboptimal image quality in 10 to 15% of patients. So Basically, you could miss the mass altogether. It has a very narrow f field of view, so you can't see where the mass came from outside the chest or whether or not it even extends outside the heart. You can, you know, there's a lot of artifacts with echocardiography, which we'll talk about in a little bit, which you can mistaken for a mass, leading to more invasive measures like TEE. Uh, and you, you can't really provide any data on tissue characteristics of that mass, like whether or not it's fat, whether or not it's calcified, whether or not it's fibrous, whether or not it's a thrombus like CT or MRI can. So with echocardiography, we always have to start off with, well, where are those common artifacts? Where are those normal structures that look, could look like abnormal masses so that we don't actually, you know, think they're, you know, lead to further testing because we think that they're abnormal cardiac masses. So in the left atrium, basically what can be there that can look like a mass includes a very prominent um, raffae between the left upper pulmonary vein and the left atrial appendage. Sometimes we call that the Q-tip or the Coumadin ridge. The atrial suture line after a cardiac transplant, you can have artifacts secondary to prosthetic aortic valves, significant artifact due to prosthetic mitral valves and mitral annular calcification. Um, in the right atrium, the crista terminalis is most commonly thought to be a mass, especially when it's prominent, and that's just the tissue right before the superior vena cava. Um, you can also have very uh, thick and extensive uh, Chiari network and eustachian valves that look like masses, but again, they're just normal variants. You can have lipomatous hypertrophy of the atrial septum, which leads on to the right atrium, which can look like a mass, but again, just a normal uh, variant uh, tied to aging. And you can have pacemaker wires and catheters and suture lines, again, after cardiac transplant. And in the LV, you have to look out for accessory papillary muscles, LV tendons, aberrant cordae. And in the RV, the moderator band, the papillary muscles, and pacemaker wires and catheters. So basically, you have to ask yourself when you've identified, when you're trying to de determine whether or not it's a normal variant, artifact, or abnormal cardiac mass, is, is, the, is this mass in the same location of multiple different views? If it is in the same location, well, then it's truly a mass and not an artifact, and you just have to determine is it a normal variant or is it an abnormal cardiac mass? And of course, TE is very helpful for those posterior structures such as the left atrial appendage, the left atrium, the mitral valve, and the aorta. Echo contrast, you should use it whenever you can't see two or more contiguous uh, endocardial walls, especially if you think there may be wall motion abnormality there. And even if you can't see the atria very well, it can bring out masses that weren't visualized otherwise. And you should integrate the echo and the clinical data together to try and figure out what mass is. So this one, is not moving anymore, but you can clearly see where the mass is. It's here in the posterior annulus. It's here all the way around the posterior annulus on the short axis. It's here on the lateral annulus. It's very tuberous, um, and basically it's in a location where you would think there would be mitral annular calcification. And this is just a form of mitral annular, cal case, an annular calcification. It's just caseation, or tuberous, sometimes you say tuberous caseation, which can be a normal variant associated with aging. So this is a 55-year-old woman who had atypical chest pain, and the question is, where is the mass, and is it normal, is it an artifact, or is it abnormal cardiac mass? And you can clearly see that here it is, right here, it's very mobile, and it looks like it's attached to that inferior lateral wall. And then you can also see that there's, the intraatrial septum is also not normal, and it's going back and forth. So this is kind of, and this is just a blow up of it, and this is very classic for a eustachian valve with atrial septal aneurysm. Again, another normal variant. And finally, this is another patient where you can see there's a, there's a mass right here, a thin filamentous structure going all the way across to the apex. You can also see it here, and you can also see it here, and you can also see it here. And this is just a classic example of a, a aberrant papillary muscle with aberrant cordae.
in the left ventricle. Here's another example, and this patient is a 62-year-old man with sepsis, and you can see he's got something here, he's got something here, he's got something here, and then you see these same things uh, at 136 degrees, you can see all of those masses. So this is a classic appearance in the intraatrial septum, that dumbbell appearance of lipomatous uh, hypertrophy, and it extends on, you can see, around onto the right atrial wall, and of course that's just a catheter there in the right atrium. So what do we use on echo to try and determine once we've decided it's not an artifact, it's not a normal variant, it truly is an abnormal cardiac mass, well, what can we use to try and determine, well, is this a thrombus, is this tumor, or is this vegetation? Well, we can use the location of the mass. If it's a thrombus, it's going to be located in left atrial appendage, the LV apex, if there's wall motion abnormalities, or it's going to be in transit, and you're going to see it in the IVC, the right atrium, or the RV. If it's a tumor, it can be located anywhere all cardiac structures, including the myocardium and the pericardium. And if it's a vegetation, it's only going to be located on the valves. The appearance can help you. A thrombus is very pedunculated and spherical, especially when it's in transit and not attached to anything, or it'll be layered in the apex if it's actually attached to the myocardial wall. A tumor, of course, varies, and vegetations are very irregular and highly mobile and on the low flow side of valves. You can look for associated findings, like a thrombus, you're gonna look for LV dysfunction with wall motion abnormalities, you're gonna look for AFib, you're gonna look for mitral stenosis and left atrial enlargement, <laughs> RV dysfunction for somebody if it's in transit, tumor, you're gonna look for invasion, obstruction, collapse of the chambers, and a vegetation, you're gonna look for valvular regurgitation. The most important thing, of course, is actually the clinical history. It's more important than any of these other three to try and put it together with what you're seeing on echocardiography. So this is an example of a 48-year-old man with syncope, and you can see that he's got a very large mass filling the left atrium. It's a very homogeneous looking mass on all of these views. This is a zoomed up apical four, and on the apical long axis, again, you can see this very homogeneous mass. It looks like it's attached to this uh, posterior left atrial wall. This is a very classic echo appearance for a for a myxoma, it's just the only unusual thing about it is the stalk is not attached to the intraatrial septum, it's attached to that posterior wall of the left atrium. This is another woman who presented with dyspnea, uh, and again, I think this one's pretty easy to see what's going on here. You see, this is a picture of her inferior vena cava. You can see this very um, oval shaped mass in the inferior vena cava. And then on our subsequent images, you can see that this mass has made its way up into the right atrium and is trying to get across the tricuspid valve. The RV function is still normal because it hasn't made it any further. So this is just the classic uh, thrombus in transit. <laughs> so this is a 21-year-old patient of mine who presented with uh, shortness of breath, fevers, and chills. And you can see uh, where her mass is. It's pretty obvious. It's right here in the right ventricle. It's very mobile. Here's a zoomed out view. Again, you can see it's very, very mobile. On the short axis view, you can see it's longer than you'd think because it's extending all, all the way to the pulmonic valve. It's kind of flag shaped. But the image that gives you the best clue is actually this one right here, the apical lung. You can see that there's a little uh, membranous ventricular septal defect. So this is actually a vegetation that's occurring on the low flow side where they always occur, which in this particular case is the right ventricle. Now this was a 19 year old woman who came, she has a history of lip, lupus and she had altered mental status. So this was one of those um, uh, TIA sort of like workups. And, um, what we found on her TEE images is that the mitral valve, as you can see, is diffusely thickened from the tips all the way down to the base. So this was a classic example. Ultimately, she was diagnosed with lupus cerebritis because she was having a really bad lupus flare. So these, this is valvulitis or Liebman Sachs endocarditis due to her lupus flare. Now, is there a role for contrast in identifying masses? We mentioned earlier, absolutely, that you should give it if you don't see two or more contiguous walls. So this is an example of somebody who you can tell has a really bad LV ejection fraction. You can't really see the apex very well. You get the uh, illusion just by looking at the epicardium that it may be akinetic and that there could actually be a mass hiding up there in the apex that you can't see. <laughs> 
So in this particular case, contrast was given, and yes, you can see the EF is pretty bad. It looks like it's about 25 to 29%, but there's absolutely nothing in the apex. It's just global hypokinesis. This is another case of a man with coronary artery disease, and again, he, you know, looking here, you can see that you can't see his apex very well. The other walls look like they're mildly hypokinetic also. Um, and in this particular person, again, because you can't see the apex, you should give contrast, but you, you're not as suspicious in this case that there's a thrombus because it doesn't look like there's akinesis up there and what you can see. But when the echo contrast is given, you can see the reason is that there's only a couple segments of the apex that are akinetic. And up there in those couple segments of, <laughs> of the akinetic apex is, is a nice large thrombus. Now, cardiac tumors, most of the time they're metastatic and they're coming from structures within the thoracic cavity itself, so most commonly the lung and the breast. Um, they involve the pericardium 75% of the time. Um, primary cardiac tumors are usually medine, that's 75% of the time, and most commonly they're myxomas. And the most common malignant primary cardiac tumors, they also frequently involve the pericardium. So if you have a pericardial effusion, it's malignant, it's either going to be metastatic or it's going to be one of the sarcomas. So this is a good example of somebody who has a pericardial effusion. You can clearly see this on the subcostal and the short axis view. You can see that in the right ventricle that it's completely filled with a mass. Uh, you can see that the um, you can see that the mass, um, at least it through here from the mid uh, right ventricular wall to the apex, these segments don't look like they're moving very well, and you can clearly see this on the short axis. So that mass is invading into the right ventricle so that the wall isn't moving very well. And then on this one, you can see that when you give contrast, here's the contrast in the, what's left of the RV cavity, you can see that the mass is enhancing, so it's somewhat vascular. So this, in, in this particular patient on pathology, uh, it was consistent with an angiosarcoma, which is the most common malignant tumor in, um, uh, in the heart. So this is a 36-year-old who came with dyspnea, and you can see her mass is actually in the left atrium, and it's coming down the pulmonary veins. So you can see these are the lower pulmonary veins, uh, and they're, they're completely filled with tumor, and it's extending onto the posterior part of the left atrium. All of these views are kind of showing you the same thing. This one is a little bit still showing you that the pulmonary veins are completely filled with this tumor and it's filling up over half of the left atrium. And this was a lady who was subsequently found to have sarcoma, pulmonary sarcoma, and it had metastasized via the pulmonary veins into the heart. So cardiac myxomas, they make up about 27% of all primary cardiac tumors, and as we said earlier, the most common location is in the left atrium, and usually there's a little thin stalk that attaches the intraatrial septum. But this is showing you unusual presentations of, of cardiac myxomas. Every single one of these on pathology was found to be a myxoma. You can see this one is showing you that there's one in the right atrium, also very homogeneous appearance. Uh, that only happens about 15% of the time, and this one looks you know, very different from the others in the left ventricle, and that only happens 5% of the time. And this is the pathology, or the surgical specimen of this uh, myxoma that was removed from the left ventricle. Now, this was a young woman with Bechet's, and she presented with dyspnea, and what was found on her echo image was uh, this mass that looked like it was entangled within the cordae of the right ventricle. You can see it here. It's very mobile, and you know, again, here you can see that it's entangled within the cordae. It was thought that maybe this was a, fibro, a papillary fibroblastoma, so she went on to surgery for, have surgery to have this mass removed, and it actually came back as just inflammatory infiltrate related to her Bechet's disease, and she actually recurred several months later, so the best treatment for her was just increase of her immunosuppressive therapy. This is a 50-year-old who, um, this was just an echo for hypertension, and they found that she had a very mobile mass in her apex. You can see it here, you can see it here. Contrast was given, and you can see that the apex moves nicely, so it's less likely a thrombus and more likely a tumor, just because she doesn't have any associated findings that would make you suggest that this was a thrombus. So she went on to also have this surgically removed, and this is just the, her intraop photos, and once they get inside the left ventricle, you're gonna see that this mass 
is really um, tightly entangled. You're going to see it just in a little bit. Here we go. So it's going to be right here. So you can see that it's sitting way up here at the apex, right here, now over to the side. And it, you could, there it is. So it's this little yellow mucoid mass, look very similar to that surgical specimen that we saw the myxoma look like. And you can see that here, these are all trabeculae. And you can see that there's going to be a lot of uh, cutting of these trabeculae to try and remove this, this mass, which is really strongly adherent uh, to these trabeculae up here in the apex. There it is. So this, so he's going to pop it up in just a minute, but this mass was eventually sent to pathology. There it is, nice little eucoid mass. And this turned out to be a papillary fibroblastoma, very unusual location, because usually these are st stuck to the cordae or they're stuck to the valvular tissue, and this one was actually stuck to the trabeculae in the apex, so very unusual location for this. Now, we're going to switch to Dr. Nabi. You want to load up your slides? Okay, so good afternoon, guys. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the s mostly CMR aspect of the assessment of cardiac masses. And, um, and I think the main point I'd like you all to take away is that, you know, for sure when it comes to the assessment of cardiac masses, CMR can be a very, very, very helpful complement to echocardiography. And, the, um, and I hope with uh, through my slides, you'll see why. And the reason is, is um, because of the ability to, to perform tissue characteristics. And so I'll get started and I hope I uh, uh, prove that to y'all. Okay, so um, this is one of the classic figures we've seen. Uh, you know, most of the time you'll see some sort of mass in some structure with echocardiography, and you're kind of left with the same differential. Is this an artifact, is this thrombus, is this a vegetation, or is this tumor? And a lot of times with echo, you based on where the structure is, what it's attached to, and some regional wall motion of the, the myocardium, you kind of try to figure out, you know, uh, you give a differential of what the structure is. Now, um, some of the more advanced imaging techniques, I think, can be a definite significant source of help when if you're really trying to not become a non-invasive pathologist and try to really identify what the structure is, you know, without having to cut the patient open. And the two techniques that can help you with this are cardiac MRI, and, and there's going to be a lot of use of cardiac MRI with masses. And the reason is because, and cardiac CT. And the reason for this is both of these techniques have very large field of views. So you're not just restricted to this, you know, the particular uh, s um, location that you're imaging, you can actually see everything else that's going on around it. So that becomes very important. Um, then, of course, both of these techniques have very, very high spatial resolution. So that's important. You know, if you want to see if something, you have the ability to see it well is very helpful. Now, one particular uh, quality that CMR has that has uh, that is above and beyond all the other techniques is again this r uh, um, uh, ability to characterize tissue or the ability to be a non-invasive pathologist. So, and we'll show you some of that. Um, so hopefully by the end of this, you'll see some incremental value of how um, these techniques can help us in assessing cardiac masses. Okay, so just a kind of a, to get you, you know, talking the same language as us, kind of get you feel what our protocols are. Uh, we start with, there's two types of uh, uh, components of our imaging. Our first imo imaging that we do is what we call our functional imaging. This is really getting it our bright blood images through the chest, trying to see where this uh, object or this mass is 
and how it behaves. Is it moving? Is it not moving? What is it attached to? Uh, things like that. Then the second part of this uh, study tends up being what we call our structural imaging, where we perform both pre-contrast and post-contrast actual assessment of the uh, intrinsic tissue qualities of the mass. And we'll get a lot more into this, uh, this is just for you know, opening conversation's sake. So what is it with the functional images? It's something like this. You know, you, we can literally, with the, we take all the standard uh, uh, transthoracic echocardiac uh, views that you all are used to, but if we do identify a mass, then with the use of our, our pointer, you can literally you know, cut any slice plane or any slice location you want to really hone in on this uh, structure. Um, identify what it's attached to. Is it moving? Is it not moving? Where is it extending to? You know, all the things that help you make it. Um, when it comes to tissue care, once you've done that kind of functional assessment, the rest is structural. Uh, this is where we now try to discriminate what the tissue is. Uh, it's composed of two different types of um, um, uh, images. One is what we call our pre-contrast images. These are what is known as our T1 weighted images and our T2 weighted images. They both have a particular function. I'll show you uh, more as uh, cases as we go along. Uh, but this is now interrogating just intrinsic qualities of the tissue itself how they behave in, in particular, T1 and T2 environment. And then finally, we'll administer gadolinium contrast. And then it's all an assessment after that um, based on um, looking at how the mass behaves once contrast has been administered. And there's a couple of things that we can look at. We can look at first pass resting perfusion. Is the mass uh, to have a lot of vascularity? We can look at delayed hyperenhancement. will tell us whether for masses, it's not much as scar as that you're as you're used to about thinking um, in the uh, LV, but rather than scar and I mean scar or delayed hyperenhancement indicates that there's fibrosis, inflammation, you know, some sort of vascularity there. And then finally, this concept of long TI imaging, where we actually then probe for thrombus. And I'll get you'll, you'll see more examples of this. So the first are the pre-contrast images. These are, uh, again, our T1 and T2 weighted images. Most important point you all have to know is that different structures in the body behave differently um, in T1 and T2 environments. And we can actually, just, just based on their inherent physical principles. And we could take advantage of that because we can create sequences to try to figure out uh, a combination of our T1 and T2 sequences to try to figure out exactly what something is. And I'll just give you an example. If you look at fat here, you know, fat will tend to have um, a, a very rapid T1 recovery and a very rapid T2 decay. So something like fat would appear bright in our T1 weighted images and appear dark on our T2 with fat saturation um, uh, images. Whereas if you look at something like water, uh, water will behave opposite. Water tends to have a very long T1 recovery and therefore will ab appear dark in T1 weighted images, whereas in T2 weighted images it tends to have a long decay and therefore will appear bright. So you will take these, uh, these um, uh, intrinsic tissue properties of T1 and I'll show you some images how you can figure it all out. When it, once you've administered contrast, there's about th three sequences that I had mentioned that we could perform. The first is just simply assessing vascularity. Here you're watching the flow of contrast as it transits the heart. And I, I hope you can appreciate at the tip of the heart there, there's a round globular mass. And we're just looking at whether there's uptake of contrast as uh, contrast is going through the heart. And in this particular case, we felt there was minimal vascularity. Contrast this to this large mass here in the mediastinum pointed out by the yellow arrow. You can see how robustly it takes up contrast almost to the same degree of um, uh, what the blood pool looks like. And you now you can compare it to the structure that has minimal vascularity to truly appreciate the difference. Um, <coughs> we then perform delayed what we call our hyperenhancement images. Uh, again, classically, y'all are used to seeing this for scar imaging. Here, we use it to just see whether our mass has taken up contrast. And I'll tell you why 
a mass that takes up contrast, why it's important for us to know that. But general concepts here, without getting into the physics, are we've administered contrast about 10 minutes later. Contrast slowly gets into um, regions of uh, expanded extracellular space and is slow to wash out. We have a, a inversion recovery sequence. We're actually able to null the myocardium plaque. And anything that has taken up gadolinium, which is a T1 shortening agent, will appear bright. So, um, and this is just an example of this. You have a large mass sitting on top of the anterior wall here. And I, I hope you'll appreciate um, if it plays well. I know the lights are very bright. But if you were to look on my screen, you would notice that this mass, whatever it is, has taken up thrombus. And for us, uh, has taken up contrast. And for us, whenever s a mass has taken up contrast, that is very, very uh, uh, suspicious for tumor. All right, and finally, the <coughs> third sequence that we use post-contrast is what we call our long TI imaging. This is a specific probe <coughs> designed to help detect thrombus. Um, and basic idea is, as you well know from uh, echocardiography, uh, a, a thrombus does not take up contrast. It's completely avascular. So, you know, just like it appears dark on echo images, same with, with CMR, we, can, we create a sequence where we image with a, what's known as a long TI. The only thing that can appear dark at such a long TI is something that has taken up no contrast. And in this particular case, it would be um, a thrombus, as this, uh, this um, uh, image indicates. So uh, on these images, on long TI images, anything that appears jet black has not taken up contrast, indicating to you it's avascular and likely thrombus. All right, so how do we assess cardiac mass with CMR? Well, I think the first question is you have to decipher whether is this a true mass or a pseudo mass, okay? So that's very important. So here is the structure. And Carla, I think, probably showed something similar in this. Uh, this was a 74-year-old, had a stroke, found to have an uh, possibly incidental right atrial mass. And you know, uh, you heard the differential of all the different things in the right atrium. And you probably will report that in your report because you're not sure, right? Um, in this particular case, it's our, uh, I only brought this study out. This just shows you the, you know, um, the superior spatial resolution of the, uh, of the advanced imaging techniques. Here it was very clear. This was nothing more than um, a prominent uh, Christa terminalis. Um, um, and um, you know, th that was a very, you, know, you didn't have to do much more on any of those structural imaging uh, uh, techniques that we do, although we would have done that anyways for this case. How about this? This looks like a, uh, a large mass that seems to come in and out of your view um, in the left atrium. This was a 51-year-old CAD admitted with epigastric pain. Um, you know, here's the corresponding CMR images. Now, I do understand, I know the echo, echo image uh, physicians in the room will say, you know, well, you want to make sure that you see it in several different views. Absolutely, I agree. You know, in this particular case, you know, uh, you know, I'll show you some further images. They may feel that there's something else coming in from the back. You may have wanted to do a, a test for that. I agree with all of that. But, you know, in reality, oftentimes we're left with a single image or a, an outside reader, maybe not our own physicians, would read this echo and probably have called out a mass. And so just, you know, these are, you know, um, artifacts that are known to show up with echo that we can quickly resolve with CMR with, uh, you know, very limited imaging. In this particular case, as we did a bright blood stack through the chest wall, he had a very large hiatal hernia. I know in that same case, if you would have probably fed the patient a Diet Coke and then imaged with a transthoracic echo, you would have probably made the diagnosis with then as, as well. But here it kind of shows you, you can see this hiatal hernia is completely pushing up against this left atrium. So you can see that you know, it was bouncing in and out of the plane. You were just you know, cutting it in a, um, 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 uh, you would cut the left atrium and then you would cut into this hernia. Um, so it's important, uh, just like with echo, Carla mentioned this, I won't spend too much time. You really, really have to know what's normal and what's abnormal in each 
of your different chambers to um, uh, come up with a comprehensive differential. All right, so once you've kind of figured out um, whether something is a true mass or a pseudo mass, then I'm going to take you down the line of uh, if you do have uh, identified a true mass, the next question is, is this pseudo tumor or is this tumor? And in pseudo tumor, I broke it down into specifically, is this fat, is this fluid, is this calcium, is this thrombus? Now, one of the key things um, that I'd like to point out here is pseudo tumors for us by definition, all of these images that I'm about to show you demonstrating these different types of pseudo tumors, all will not take up contrast. So that will be very different from the uh, right hand side of the screen, where with tumors, you'll see they'll take up contrast. It becomes a very important uh, differentiator for us. So here is a mass. Carla showed something very similar with echo. You see this very bright echo density. Yes, I agree. We've all seen it a million times. We know what it is without having to do any testing. Um, um, but my point purpose is to show you how we can assess with tissue characteristics, being the non-invasive pathologist with CMR. So here's what it, uh, the dumbbell sign looks with uh, CMR. Uh, but particularly here, this, this uh, structure behaves in a very, very characteristic pattern under T1 and T2 settings. It was bright under T1, and, when, and, and it was dark under T2 with fat saturation. There's only one thing that does that, and that's fat. As soon as you see this bright on T1, dark on T2, that's fat. You can be confident, 100% confidence, that this is fat, and therefore leads you to the diagnosis that you know, this is uh, uh, lipomans hypertrophy of the interatrial septum. So what about this case? A little bit different. Um, here, look at the large field of view. You're able to see completely outside the pericardium. This is a large structure abutting the right side of the heart, abutting the right pericardium. Um, B and C, B is your T1 images, T is your C, T, uh, T2 images. You can see this mass behaves very differently. It's dark on your T1 images and bright on your T2 images. This again is something very, this is characteristic only for fluid or water. And therefore, once you see something like this and then a, char a characteristic structure that's also bright on SSFP imaging, classic location in the costrophenic angles, you can with confidence be, you know, know that this is a large pericardial cyst. But again, the importance here is not the obvious, but rather how we're using our structural interrogation techniques to really figure out things. All right, how about this one? A little bit more tougher. This was a patient who just had bypass surgery, goes home, they do an echo there and see a mass um, um, located uh, you know, in the atrium and was referred right back that you've missed something in the operating room and the patient needs to go back to the operating room. So th this is this structure. Um, you can see it here. I'll let you just take a quick look at it. But more important for us is, you know, we kind of in our mind have created differential, but then what are the tissue properties that it's showing? And the main thing is this was a very classic, uh, uh, pa very pathognomonic um, uh, pattern here on the late Gadolin enhancements. Basically, if you look at the uh, pre-contrast images, it appears dark. On post-contrast imaging, it is also dark, but it had this very characteristic rim of hyper-enhancement. And this is some, what I've read is called a popcorn pattern. And this is um, synonymous with uh, you know, caseating mitral <laughs> calcification. So uh, again, yes, was it obvious from the imaging? Sure, I mean, but in your hands, right? Mm -hmm. In other hands, it can be very much more difficult, but Again, how CMR can actually look and in interrogate intrinsic tissue characteristics. All right, and here is the uh, CT. So this patient actually came for, to us. He actually was referred to the surgeon to the CMR lab. We were, of course, co we were confident we had made the diagnosis, but for fun, I encouraged them to get a non-contrast CT scan. I wasted a little bit of resources, just a little. <laughs> 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 and you know, you have the classic um, bulk of calcium sitting there. <coughs> Go back to the CMR. What kind of, so do you have perfusion in it? <coughs> no. It was meant to show no perfusion. It's right here. It's this mass right here. But on LGE, it's 
there's contrast uptake in the periphery. And this is meant to be, you know, whether this calcium causes a rim of fibrosis or a little bit of inflammation around this hard chunk of cal necrotic fat and calcium. And by echo, y you know, for all of us who are in the echo labs, you know, we would have probably from day one have called it caseating NAC. Okay, what about this? This was 52-year-old, MVR, you know, chronic AFib, humongous atria, two masses floating around. Uh, admitted mitodiastolic heart failure. Um, <laughs> um, you know, if you look at T1, T2, it was basically uh, ISO to the, um, 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 it, it looked exactly like the myocardium, so it didn't, was it dark or wasn't bright. And then on f a, a rest perfusion where you give contrast and just watch the flow of contrast through the, the as it transits the heart, you could, uh, I hope you'll agree with me that these two masses don't appear to be taking up any contrast. Uh, we performed our long TI imaging. Remember that was a thrombic, thrombus imaging probe. Here it's set in such a way that at such a long TI or a TI of 600, the only thing that can remain without any uptake of contrast is uh, thrombus. And so therefore anything that bl uh, it, it remains dark in these images is thrombus or, is, uh, is a, or a completely avascular structure. So this was, you know, with probing using tissue characteristics consistent with thrombus. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, I'm glad Dr. Shah is here. Uh, <laughs> the, the, they, are, they are different f phases the hemoglobin molecule goes th through. And theoretically, you can tell the difference between acute and chronic. I know in our own lab, we don't necessarily probe for whether it's acute or chronic because I think it's I mean, difficult. Do you do T2 weighted imaging in an acute thrombus where there's still a higher water content? Increase signal on the T2 imaging, but the chronic setting has increased signal on T2 going away. Are there any tumors that could be on long T1 still They're not showing them? So Don't tell me no. No, so the, the, the issue is that this long T1, it depends on when you do the imaging after you give the contrast. Because right. effectively, what it's doing is it's saying, does contrast have a way to make its yeah. way in? Through diffusion. That's right, right, right. Now, if you don't wait long enough, you could miss a tumor that just has very, very slow vascularity. Right. Uh, so that's why typically what we do for these, we'll do this kind of at the, you know, 10 minutes after we give contrast, and then repeat this again at the very end of the scan, typically 30 minutes post contrast, to see if there's some slow contrast that gets in. Because you're absolutely right. That's the one thing is some tumors that have very poor very vascularized may not show any contrast diffusion early on. And we've seen that in cases with tumors that are being actively treated with uh, anti-tumor agents. Right. And you've completely destroyed their microvasculature, so it takes a lot of time for it to get in there. Um, so here is just a quick case. Um, you know, Cine CMR shows you this mass here on the anterior wall. But it's really, again, the ability with long TI imaging to be able for you, you didn't probably even see wall motion, you can just with, you know, use with tissue characteristics, you, could, you, you know this is thrombus, it's dark with our long TI imaging. Um, oh, and then this was the same case, this patient was treated with anticoagulation, and you can see complete resolution just to prove it to you. Um, so what is the uh, diagnostic accuracy for MRI for thrombus? This was 160 patients, all had LV reconstruction surgery, so the the, the, it was all, um, uh, the patho uh, patho true pathology was the gold standard here. And it, thrombus was presented in about 30% of cases. You could see the sensitivity of and specificity of CMR was uh, much higher than the other techniques, As especially sensitivity. Um, what if you use uh, delayed Hansen CMR as the standard for LV thrombus? This just shows you that you know non-contrast echo uh, can have a very low sensitivity. Carla has shown that you, nice cases where you don't see anything without contrast. Contrast echo is significantly better uh, because you're able to see things better. And then a CM, a CIN CMR, at least in this study, still outperformed 
uh, contrast echocardiography. Um, <coughs> and so what are, why, why does uh, uh, echo miss thrombi? Um, and it's, of course, image quality is one. For sure, but you know, where you're most likely to miss thrombi is they're small in size or if they're mural and laminated in shape. They can just appear part of the wall, and if you don't have the difference in tissue characteristics, uh, you can miss this. And for shortening. And for shortening, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Vi visualization. Yeah. 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 Uh, what are the things that with CMR that can help you make a diagnosis of thrombus? Obviously, same as echo, <laughs> you know, uh, you can look at wall motion, you can look at wall function, the greater the likelihood of having. Uh, uh, dysfunctional wall segments and the greater amount of scar that you have, more than likelihood the, 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 the mass that you're seeing is associated, is likely to be thrombus. And this was just one study that looked at all the different features for identifying uh, thrombus and of course the long TI imaging really was the, um, had the highest diagnostic accuracy of all our, all the CMR uh, uh, techniques. And so this is, oh, okay. So then we come back into our decision pathway. Once we have figured out whether this is uh, a, a, a pseudo tumor, remember those are things that do not take up contrast, to now we're on the right, side, uh, right hand side of the screen where we're actually, if your mass is taking up uh, uh, contrast, this is very synonymous with tumor. And this is just an example. We already showed you on the right-hand side, thrombus takes up no contrast. Here, this mass on the intraatrical wall, um, you could see on first-pass perfusion, it appears, uh, it's taken up contrast. And on LGE, you can definitely see the brightness in it. Whenever you see contrast uptake, associate that with tumor. Notice I didn't say benign or malignant, I just said tumor. Um, um, and this is just two examples. These were myxomas with all, uh, imaged with all the different sequences, sarcoma imaged with all the different sequences. If you just look at those sequences uh, such with post-contrast, such as first-pass perfusion, delayed hyper-enhancement, uh, you will notice contrast uptake. And these were both uh, associated. Notice one is benign, one is malignant, a tumor uptake, uh, and the corresponding histology. Uh, studies have looked at, you know, using CMR techniques to identify the difference between tumor and thrombus. It's nothing different than what I told you. Uh, tumor will, in all your post-contrast sequences, will take up contrast, will take up contrast, will take up contrast. Okay, so step three, again, uh, step two, you've identified tumor by the fact that it takes up thrombus. Now, how do you figure out benign and malignant? And here, you know, I think both Dr. Shai and I, you know, Dr. Yang, all agree that, you know, uh, because there's, uh, you know, he here, you know, you start relying, there's no true definitive tool we have to tell you benign from malignant. There's a lot of crossover. Um, so we start relying on other features, just like you all do in echocardiography. You know, the larger the size, the more irregular defined borders, the more invasion of tissue planes. Um, if it involves the right side of the heart, if you've got evidence of involvement of the pericardium, the, uh, the pleural space, uh, if you see multiple lesions, all of those in your mind, you start thinking malignancy, uh, you know, malign malignancy. Um, so, you know, what are things that we can do? Sure, um, there, you know, again, th th there's nothing to show here, but um, again, contrast is what identifies um, uh, malignancy. And in this study where they tried to differentiate between malign, uh, uh, malignant and benign, you know, for sure the malignant tumors in this study tended to be larger and exhibited more first pass perfusion and LGE. So, you know, what does more mean? Um, a lo lot of crossover here. But in general, you see something that really lights up more than likely. Uh, you know, it's going to be, uh, and it's large, it's going to be malignant. Um, <coughs> and uh, I've already shown you this slide. So um, uh, this was just the sensitivity specificity of uh, a malignant tumor. You could see the, sensitiv the specificity is um, borderline, so we really have moderate abilities. Uh, we really need tissue diagnosis to help define uh, what kind of tumor it is. 
have suspicion uh, just based on other things. So uh, just a little bit about cardiac tumors. I hope you know the most frequent type of tumor you expect. If you see a mass and if it's a tumor in the heart, more than likely it is uh, metastatic in origin, most common breast, lung, melanoma, um, uh, things that are coming from the kidneys, um, are usually spread by direct extension, hematogenous or uh, lymphatogenous. Primary cardiac tumors are much, much, uh, are, are infrequent, um, and more than likely, if you have a primary uh, a tumor, it is more than likely to be benign, things like myxoma, papillary fibroastoma, and cardiac lipomas, whereas the primary malignant tumors are the least frequent of all uh, tumors. Um, location helps with etiology. Carla, I think, probably on all of these. You know, if, if things involve the valves, we're looking at fibroelastoma vegetations. If we're concerned about sarcomas. Uh, if it's in the pericardium, we're worried about metastasis. If it's in the left atrium, we're worried about um, myxomas. If it's in the ventricle, we're worried about fibromas and rhabdomyomas. Uh, so I think you know, when you're coming to a diagnosis of a mass, it's very important to know the history, the signs and symptoms, bar markers, tumor markers, and then um, knowing a little bit about cardiac imaging will definitely help you make a correct diagnosis. And sometimes, um, as we all know, it's not one test that can be very helpful, and that's not always CMR that can answer all the questions. There are cases where CT is required. Those include patients who have contraindications to CMR, such as those with metal, those who we can't give gadolinium to, such as those who have end-stage renal disease, those who need a bit more uh, test, or who have claustrophobia, uh, will benefit from CT. If you need concomitant coronary information, maybe CT is the better way to go. Um, or if you've identified calcium is a, of the question, uh, CT is a, a way to go. TEE, of course, uh, always a good choice. Definitely very helpful for small, highly mobile masses. Um, okay, so I, uh, one o'clock. These are just my take-home points. I'll let you all read it. And if you have any questions, please let me know.